the proof of love. Love words are rather cheap. Men use them lightly, promising eternal undying love to those they seek to win. Millions of words have been written, sung, and quoted to prove the reality of love. But God, you see, to never limits the revelation of his love for you to words. He declares that real love is not in words, nor of the tongue only, but in deed. And had he said a million times, I love you, and had there been no deed of love, you would have, have every reason to doubt the genuineness of that love. He's willing to prove the sincerity of his love. Rather, he's anxious to commend the nature of his love to you. He desires that his love be put on exhibit, that you be introduced to the wondrous nature of it and become convinced that God really loves you. Now, there's a time and a place where he exhausted all means to demonstrate the great love wherewith he loved you. That place is the cross of Calvary where his darling son was given to death and hell in order that he might commend his love to you, accept and enjoy you. The scriptures tell that in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifested, that is, he caused to shine forth or made apparent the eternal wonder of his love for you. There in simple faith in the record God gave of his son, you can perceive, that is, you can learn by experience and discernment, the truth of God's undying love for you. Let me tell you the story of Jesus. My purpose is not to discourage you by endless scripture quotes as though I have something to prove to your reason. I have only a simple story of love to tell you. My ministry is to declare the record God has given of his Son to your needy heart in simple words you can receive as the Holy Spirit works the glory of faith in you. Now listen, as I tell you about the eternal God who was in the beginning, and with him was his only begotten Son, who was the delight of his heart. In loving communion and fellowship they enjoyed each other's love by the power of their Holy Spirit. The Son was equal with the Father in all things, and he never thought it robbery to be so. All things were created by the Son, and for his pleasure and all heavenly creatures bowed before him in glad worship and praise. In the council halls of eternity, God foresaw the human race, and in that race he saw and knew you. For you he created a universe, allowed Lucifer to rebel against him, purged the earth, planted a garden in Eden, created man in his image, and allowed him to fall from his original estate to a place of alienation and separation. You were created to be the object of his affections, for God is love, and that love can only be manifested and God glorified as it is revealed to one who is unworthy of true love. The mystery of his love to you was a secret hidden in the mind of God from before the foundation of the world, and it was his original thought. In holy councils among the persons of the Godhead, it was predestined that one would come to earth in the fullness of time to tabernacle or dwell temporarily in the likeness of man in order to become like you, understand you, and take your place at the judgment of God for your sin and sins. The Son took gladly this ministry of love, and there, in the presence of the holy angels, he willfully laid aside the insignia of his majesty all his divine and eternal rights as God, and came to earth to be born of a virgin that he might do the will of God, which was to bring you to himself in love. Bethlehem was not the origin of the Son of God. A woman bore the body he occupied, but the occupant was of old from everlasting. He had walked the corridors of eternity, commanded the universe into existence, had given life to every living thing, and he was himself the light of the world he created. It was by his power that all things hung together and all creation was subject to his eternal word. A child was born that day at Bethlehem, but the eternal Son was a love gift from God. The Emmanuel of the Old Testament prophecies had come, 
God is with us. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Eternal Counselor was the blessed darling Son of God whose very name would be called Wonderful. The hands that had held back the sea had now become limited to the strength of man and were made to cling to the finger of a woman. The eyes that were too holy to look upon sin were for a moment dimmed by the limited sight of a babe. The self-existent God was placed in dependence upon the earthly care of humans. He chose not to take upon Himself the nature of angels, but was for a season made lower than the angels, that He might learn of you and the fellowship of your sufferings as a man. He who was rich became poor as a cringing beggar, that you through his poverty might become rich. So poor that a manger was his cradle, so helpless that he was carried in his mother's arms to the temple of God. He lived in obscurity without wealth, influence, or recognition. He rode to Jerusalem on a borrowed beast. He had no place to lay his head, though the birds and foxes he made had the security of earthly shelter. His miracles are legend, and his words were unlike any words ever heard of man. He evidenced every proof of his divinity, yet lived within the limitations of man, depending only on the Holy Spirit of God for his help and strength. From the day he entered the race, he carried your sorrows and became by personal experience acquainted with all your grief. He was known for his many troubles, and he was called a man of sorrows. None ever saw him laugh, but many saw him weep as the dreary days went past under the heaviness of your lifetime of unhappiness. His only acquaintances were your griefs, and like a beast of burden he bore them all without a murmur. He suffered every sort of personal rejection. He was despised, considered contemptible, judged the very last of all men, and in his death described himself as a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. The human race laughed and mocked him to scorn when he sought to reveal himself to them. He was rejected left destitute of man, forsaken of all, and those who saw him hid their faces from him. He was afflicted, browbeaten of all. Sinful men looked down their nose at such a despicable person, and though he was sorely depressed, he bore it all in silence, and like a lamb, remained silent as they led him to the slaughter. He was daily oppressed, that is, he was driven, taxed, harassed, and tyrannized. Those he came to save and love sought to ensnare and trap him like a hunted animal. He was pursued like a mighty army pursues a fleeing band of renegades, and he was hounded as a debtor is browbeaten by his creditors. Oh, Jesus was the target of all the malice and hatred of the human heart for God. He was the most misunderstood man of all history. While well, the neighbors condemned his mother before he was born, and he entered the race under a cloud of suspicion. And in the eyes of men, he never did a right thing in his life. Why was wrong, they said, to be born in a manger if he was really the Son of God? Wrong to desert his parents at the temple when he was twelve years old? Wrong to live in Galilee, for no good thing ever came from such a wretched place? He was judged wrong by men to be eaten up with zeal for his father's house. They thought his words were wrong, and all men sought to twist, pervert, and warp every precious thing he uttered in hopes of trapping him by his speech. They even misunderstood his physical appearance, and they saw no beauty in him at all. They considered his personal features so repulsive that they judged he had been smitten and afflicted of God to be so utterly void of beauty. He aged before his time under the load he carried for you. When he was but thirty years of age, the Pharisees estimated his age at near fifty. The wonderful miracles and works he performed for all were rejected as mere tricks and deception, worked by the power of the devil, they said. His family and friends didn't believe him, 
and he was condemned for doing good on the Sabbath. Yet he was the Lord in fulfillment of the Sabbath. They said it was wrong to let a woman of the street touch him in worship, and wrong to eat with sinners. It was wrong for him to enter the house of a wicked man like Zacchaeus. And if he was really God, it was wrong to have harlots and sinners as his friends. Now who ever heard of a king riding upon a donkey, or entering his capital city without heralds and an impressive army? Even Peter, the spokesman of the apostles, rebuked him publicly for the mere mention of his purpose to die at Calvary for you. Oh, Jesus was the only life mankind had ever known, yet they comprehended it not. He was the true light that came to light every man, yet men he made gave him no recognition. He came to save men and enable them to be the sons of God, yet they would not associate themselves with him in a personal and intimate way. He walked all the lonely years of his life, misunderstood and in the form of a slave. He died a man of no reputation. He was truly the Lamb of God, and as a lamb he was shorn in his silence and slaughtered in his meekness, betrayed by one who had lifted his hand in fellowship with him at the Last Supper, denied by the one man who had once declared him truly to be the Son of God, hated by the nation he chose from among all nations to be his very own. Oh, listen with your heart. As I tell you how he crossed the brook Kidron, east of Jerusalem on the last night of his hell on earth, there, where the ground slopes upward to the Mount of Olivet, he enters a garden known as Gethsemane. I see him there in the pale light of a full moon, with a smell of spring in the air, as he falls on his face in the agony of prayer. Terror fills his heart, shock and amazement overtake him. With heart pounding, throat dry, this once peaceful and happy man who had just sung a hymn of praise and spoken cheerfully of his approaching death now bursts into tears. Sweat now stands out on that lovely face and it appears to be blood. Oh, what turned his communion to separation? What changed his peace to trouble and his joy to grief? Oh, it was something he saw in that place of prayer. It was not the full impact of what Judas had done, nor was it the experiences of the night yet ahead of him, nor the fear of the cross with its nails and spear. It was something offered to him by his father. He said it was a cup, and dear reader, your sins, iniquities, transgressions, and all the guilt, penalty, rejection, and death that belongs to you filled that cup. It was offered to him to take as his very own and to drain in his death at Calvary. This is what he thirsted for, and this is what he finished at the place called Golgotha. No wonder he was heavy and depressed and confused as one not at home and in unfamiliar circumstances. No wonder he was exceeding sorrowful, encompassed with grief and encircled in an ocean of sorrow. No wonder that it almost killed him and in his agony caused him to pray. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Hear him give now the death wail, a sharp, shrill, ear-piercing shriek followed by prolonged wails and sobbing as he sees for the first time the full price he must pay for your acceptance. He came to earth to commend his love to you. He came to earth to prove the sincerity of that love. He came to earth and to this moment to take away forever from your heart the doubt that God loves you. He saw the cost of that love and the sacrifice it would demand. He saw the impossibility of saving you without the cross and hell he must take for you. It was you, dear listener, who turned the most precious earthly place of fellowship and communion into a living hell. It was you who would separate him from his father's face and you who nearly killed him that night as he looked into your heart and life and saw you as you are. But, oh, dear listener, Jesus, having loved you, loved you to the very end. They take him away now. The longest night on earth has begun for Jesus. They accuse him, condemn him, 
tie his blessed hands and smite him with their fists in the face until he's beyond human recognition. They lash him with a cruel lash into whose leather thongs bits of glass and metal have been embedded to create a pattern of brutality across his precious back that resembles a freshly furrowed field. They make for the king of glory a crown woven from the acacia bush with thorns as long as a man's finger and sharp as a needle. They pierce his brow, spit upon him, curse and mock him throughout the long night, and then lay upon his bleeding back the cross upon which he will hang. Taunted and driven like a criminal, he struggles along the path of sorrows until he falls beneath his load, exhausted. He is dragged to Calvary, spread eagled on the cross, Nails driven through the hands and feet, lifted up between heaven and earth, and the cross thumped into the socket of rock to wrench every bone out of place. Ah, now the true dimensions of God's love can at last be revealed. It is here at the cross, not in his earthly life, that God's love is fully manifested to you. Here is where true love will not fail will hang on and never let go until he has proven the sincerity of that love for you, the little man inside. Here at the crossroads of eternity, God is at his best and man is at his worst. See yourself in the self-righteous people who jeer, curse, mock, and spit upon him. See yourself, for had you been there, you would have joined them. See yourself in the Jews, too sensitive to touch a corpse concerned only about removing him from the tree before sundown that they might go to their ritual on the morrow with clean hands. See them scurrying like rats to Pilate to beg him to allow soldiers to take a heavy wooden mallet and break his legs to be sure that Jesus dies quickly. See the soldiers come now to find that he is dead already. One look at his face with the matted beard stained with blood, sweat, and tears for you tells them that he is dead. They had heard his cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And now they will take a large spear and open his side with a wound so large that later Thomas could have placed his hand into it. And from that wound comes gushing forth a fountain of blood and water. You know, there's something wonderful about that incident. John describes it in his gospel as though he were extremely anxious for us to know that it's of great importance that we believe his record. The centurion was so amazed by the manner of his death that he believed him to be a righteous man and declared him to be the Son of God. Jesus didn't have to die. He said before he went to the cross that he was like a corn of wheat that had fallen into the earth that is, into mankind. If he died, he'd bring forth fruit, he said. But if he did not die, he would abide alone. He wanted you so much. He loved you so intensely. He gladly and joyfully died of his own free will. He said no man could take his life from him and that he would lay it down himself. And at the cross he dismissed his spirit and gave up the ghost of his own volition. He's the only man who ever died by his own will. He didn't suffer death. It was a free dying, an act of his own will for you. Now, many and varied are the theories given for the medical cause of Jesus' death. Let me give you my thoughts. Under intense mental and emotional anxiety, a sudden rupture of the heart is possible. Surrounding the heart is a membrane or sac called the pericardium, containing water-like substance. Now, its purpose is to lubricate the heart's surface in its continual motion. When the heart ruptures, blood often rushes into the pericardium and separates into its two substances, blood and water. Now, if this is true in the case of Jesus, the sac, fully extended, once pierced by the spear, would instantly release its contents, hence the stream of water mixed with clotted blood which issued from his blessed side was the external evidence of the real cause of his death. He was not killed by the Jews nor by the Romans, 
nor by the lash, the crown, or the fists of men. The nails didn't take his life, nor did exhaustion or any other sort of physical suffering. He gave up to the burden he carried for you. The travail of his soul for you killed him. You broke the Savior's heart. This heartbreak he carried to Calvary and for which he sacrificed his life began in Eden when you and your father Adam were separated from God and undoubted his eternal love for you. Oh, my heart often cries out to have been the cup his lips touched and blessed, to have been the bread which he broke, to have been the cloth he held as he served or the water he poured as he spoke. To have been the road he walked on the way, to have been his print in the sand, to have been the door that opened a tomb, but I was a nail in his hand. But wait, this is not the end of the story of Jesus and God's great love for you. Jesus died for the unjust that he might bring them to God. He died a substitutionary death. He literally took your place in death that you might take his place in life. You have looked at the earthly view of the cross. Now see heaven's view. God is holy and you are unholy. God is righteous and you are unrighteous. God is pure and you are defiled. God declared the wages of your sin to be death. Not mere physical death as Jesus suffered at the cross, but separation from God in the outer darkness for all eternity. For no unclean person can stand in the presence of a holy and pure God. When Jesus died, God counted you to be in him. He called you into his presence in judgment and imputed your sins and iniquities to Christ himself. This is why God forsook him at death. He dared to approach God clothed in the filthy rags of your righteousness. And God banned him from his presence. God refused to deal leniently with him, though he was his beloved son, but delivered him up to the outer darkness for you. Jesus could not enter heaven clothed in your sin. The word of God declares how he went into the lower parts of the earth and visited the hell you deserved. He descended into the pit and carried to that place of banishment, your sins, and all that would have separated you from God forever. God so loved you that he gladly gave up his son for you. And Jesus so loved you that he would not let you go, even though it meant the pains of death and the horrors of hell. But hell had no claim on the Savior. He was not a sinner, but a sin-bearer for you. And as such, he couldn't be held in that place. God raised him from among the dead ones and brought him to paradise to meet the thief he saved while on the cross. And there for three days and nights he announced the good news to the Old Testament saints that God's love had opened heaven's gate for all sinners who rest in that perfect love. He entered heaven on the day of the resurrection and took with him the blood of his sacrifice, and the first fruits of his victory presented him to God and was seated at his right hand. God glorified him with the glory he had before the foundation of the world and gave him a name that is above every name in heaven, on earth, or beneath the earth. There at the right hand of God's eternal throne the blessed Son of Man sits, his work complete, God's love demonstrated. Heaven opened for you, the guilty sinner, and the eternal God glorified forever. They say that time heals all wounds, but here is the eternal denial of that maxim. The wounds of Jesus will never heal. They remain today as the everlasting reminders of how much God loves you. He was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities, and even though a mother may forget her sucking child, he will never forget you, nor let you forget, for he has graven you on the palms of his hands. Never speak of the nail-scarred hands of the Savior. Those wounds are still as fresh as though he were slain this moment. 
that God's compassions for you might be new each morning of your life, and His great faithfulness demonstrated in loving you without waiting for you to perform to His satisfaction. He's fully satisfied in the death of the Son, and all His demands and requirements have been silenced forever in those precious wounds. When Jesus comes back to earth in glory, the Jewish nation will ask him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And he will tell them that they were made in the house of his friends. You are fully forgiven and loved for his name's sake alone. Not anything you have done, will do, or are doing now will ever establish any other relationship with God. He did all this for you when you were without strength that is, unable to perform. When you were ungodly, that is, not like him in what he did not like. When you were a sinner, that is, an enemy of God, and hostile to the blessed God who loves you. He has freely bestowed this love upon you as a permanent possession, and he loves you without any merit on your part. Lay hold of this precious love by faith, and you will never hide from God or man again. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Who can be against you? No charge can ever be laid against you in His sight. He has fully justified you on the grounds of Jesus Christ's finished work. His blood has washed you white as snow in the sight of God. His love will make you whole, free you from a lifetime of guilt, fears, inferiority complex, and dreary loneliness. It will open wide the gates that long have imprisoned you. It's nothing you have done. It is the precious blood of Christ that even now cleanses you continually from all manner of sin and sins. His blood is your present and eternal peace, hope, and righteousness. What a precious fountain for uncleanness. God has accepted you in the beloved Son, what need have you to grovel at the feet of men, ever performing to win their fleeting acceptance and favor? What need have you ever again to fear to be yourself? God loves you as you are. How shall you ever be lonely when He Himself is with you and will be with you as long as the precious eternal blood of His Lamb is on the mercy seat in heaven for you? At last, you can walk with Him without shame, and you can walk with men in the reality of what you are. Your days will be cool, and God will be your friend, and perhaps you'll enjoy a little of paradise while still on this earth.